Hello, I'm Ria Mohan and I'm a rising sophomore at Duke University. Today I'll be discussing the importance of communication and evidence generation within the gene therapy space. For some background information, the pipeline for cell therapies has expanded rapidly over the past few years after the FDA approval of an initial cohort of gene therapy products. Most of these products in development are within the preclinical phase one or phase two stages of development. However, our background research shows that there are roughly 50 to 60 gene and cell therapy products within phase three of development, and these will likely enter the market very soon. In figure one, you can see a breakdown of the pipeline that shows that there are roughly 400 drugs in the pipeline, though this number is not exact. And of these, 15% are in phase three of development. Most drugs do not have complete FDA approval. However, they have received designations such as RMAT, RPD, or orphan drug designation that allow them to be developed at this time. Currently, there are 22 gene therapy products that have been approved by the FDA. And this contrasts very greatly with the pipeline as the definitive number of drugs in the pipeline still remains uncertain. Most manufacturers with products in phase three also have more products in phase one and phase two of development. However, this is not necessarily an indication of the pipeline itself because success is not guaranteed past phase one or phase two if expected efficacy rates are not met within trials. In terms of current developments, uh, there are certain disease areas that are being targeted more than others, as well as certain payment strategies that are being used by various payers. In terms of disease areas, Neurological conditions, retinal disorders, and genetic slash rare diseases are some of the top three disease areas that are being targeted by products in phase three. Blood and immunological conditions, as well as oncological health, also are being targeted within phase three. However, most of the products for these disease areas are within phase one and phase two of development, which is why they have been separated from the three disease areas mentioned earlier. In terms of current payment strategies, there are payment strategies that various payers take and they use current mechanisms by restricting access, which is not necessarily a payment strategy, but just a method for coping with the large costs of, uh, of, costs of gene therapy products, as well as payment innovation. Private payers often use monthly or yearly installments in order to pay for these products, which means they will pay for these products over a set period of time. State Medicaid systems do something similar where they will either use change the amount of money that is allocated to them um, and deciding how much will be going to gene therapy products through um, managed care and bundled payment carve outs or they use their currently existing payment policy by choosing not to define a policy and using individual basis to de determine whether someone should get coverage or not. However, both of these are problematic approaches to payment because first they either restrict access or cause confusion as to who is eligible for which products, or they are not very sustainable to uh, be used in the future as the pipeline shows that there will be many more products entering the market very soon. The Medicare also has uh, its own strategy, which is to create MSDRGs for various types of gene therapies. And they've done this before with CAR T cell therapies. Another option that could be used is restricting access by determining who is eligible to receive gene therapy products. However, this is very problematic because it means that not everybody is eligible or able to receive life-saving treatments like these gene therapy products. And lastly, the best policy being used within the status quo is payment innovation because both private payers as well as state Medicaid are creating new systems for for paying for these products, such as through creating specific insurance products geared solely towards gene therapies, or by entering value-based agreements by amending state Medicare policies. Despite the benefit of payment innovation, there are still many barriers to access. For instance, there are there's still uncertainty of the long-term results 
of gene therapy products. And this is caused by a lack of consensus and communication between payers and manufacturers, fee-for-service payment models, as well as pre-screening programs to determine patient eligibility, because all of these decrease at patients' access to receive treatments, and this makes evidence generation a much more difficult task. Furthermore, as I discussed earlier, there is a lack of coverage despite various payment programs being put into place for these gene therapy products. And because of this, there are many short-term budgetary pressures for healthcare payers such as Medicaid uh, who are within fee-for-service systems. And all of these issues, especially the lack of evidence, will only continue to compound as more products continue entering the market. Some solutions to this include increasing communication efforts in various ways. For instance, having more collaboration occur between payers and manufacturers to generate evidence on long-term efficacy, side effects, and more can be beneficial, but can also incentivize manufacturers to improve products and also decrease administrative costs and generate evidence at a much faster rate. Furthermore, there should also be fostered discourse between stakeholders through collaboration-driven event planning, accessible informational campaigns such as newsletters or toolkits, and reflective data analysis on current communication efforts. Lastly, I want to acknowledge Ms. Patricia Green and Dr. Hamilton Lopez and give my thanks to them for guiding me through this project. I also want to give my deepest thanks to Bina Buyan Khan, Becky Ray, and Luke DeRoker for their support and mentorship through the summer. Also, thank you to Risha Bott, Julia Johnson, and the Duke Margolis Center for giving me this wonderful opportunity to learn about leadership and health policy. And lastly, thank you so much for coming to this presentation.